This week, I am joined by Matt Alderman, who's filling in for John Strand. In our first segment, we're going to interview Dave Mestes. Did I say that right? I probably butchered the pronunciation. I apologize. Mestis. Mestis. Dave Mestis, the co-founder and CTO of Bandora. We're going to talk about uh, threat intelligence and how you can use it to actually make an impact on your security program, which is going to be a lot of fun. Um, in the security uh, enterprise security news this week, we've got a lot of great stories uh, and information on their products and announcements from Proofpoint, Demisto, OneLogin, BlackBerry, Security Scorecard, Red Seal, and CoreLite. Stay tuned for all that and more on this edition of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. I'm a tiger. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly. I don't know how this is going to go because Paul's not here this week, but we're just going to give it a shot. If Even if you've got experience in security, you you can benefit from going to somewhere where, and learning about that bug again. Wearing my tactical turtleneck just for Mr. John Strand, who is on the lines via Skype. John, welcome to the program. I'm wearing the uh, tactical fleece as well, Paul. This is a fully, completely, and utterly tactical show. Are you an enterprise dissatisfied with overpriced analytics software that can't keep up with modern data? If so, then GraphWell is the solution for you. GraphWell is an unstructured data analytics platform for enterprises who demand total data visibility across their network. GraphWell lets your security team go beyond the SIM and fuse data sources to correlate and answer questions you didn't know needed to be asked. Go to gravwell.io forward slash security weekly for an unlimited data trial and gain uncompromising visibility today. Improve the efficiency and effectiveness of your security operations with DF Lab Security Orchestration, Automation, and Response Technology. Automate threat containment, orchestrate incident response, and measure operational performance with DF Lab's Inkman SOAR platform. Leverage your current security resources to minimize incident resolution time, maximize analyst efficiency, increase the number of incidents handled, and reduce overall risk. Inkman SOAR acts as a force multiplier, enabling your security team to do more with less. Streamline the full incident response life cycle automation process today. Keep your cybersecurity incidents under control with DF Labs. Visit dflabs.com forward slash security weekly and request to see Ink Mansoor live in action. Stop attackers from domain credential theft and lateral movement with a 99% success rate by using artificial intelligence to control the attacker's perception of the environment. Javelin Networks is the world's first endpoint intrusion containment platform to protect domain networks. Javelin detects targeted attacks and breaches by obfuscating Active Directory, domain controllers, domain identities, domain credentials, and all domain resources. It only takes one compromised machine to jeopardize the entire organization. Don't be a victim. Visit at javelin-networks.com and request a demo of AD Protect today. Are you worried about PCI compliance? Does your development team understand or care about security? Are you ready to face a breach of your customer's sensitive data? See the worst that can happen before it does. Black Hills Information Security can help you help management see the future. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a web application penetration test can mitigate the risk before you go live. Welcome, everyone, to episode 106 of Enterprise Security Weekly for September 12th, 2018. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, here in the studio in Rhode Island. It is G Unit Studios. We're broadcasting live today. And we've got Mr. Matt Alderman on the lines. Welcome, Matt. Thank you. You get me twice this week. It's awesome. Fun. It's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, for filling in today, Matt. It's going to be a fun show. Um, a quick announcement, uh, I believe, is our webcast with Logrhythm, which is all about tips and tricks for defending the enterprise using open source tools. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's based on my presentation I gave. Well, it actually is my presentation I gave at InfoSec World earlier this year. Uh, so if you were one of the roughly 75 people in attendance, uh, you probably don't have to attend the webcast. Um, if you're not, you should definitely attend, as we'll talk about uh, open source is kind of the double-edged sword in the enterprise, places where it makes sense, places where it doesn't, including recommendations, along with our sponsor, Logrhythm. That's happening on September 27th. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash Logrhythm and register today. Alrighty. 
Let's jump right into our interview. Dave is here from Bandura. Dave, welcome to the program. Thank you. Um, Dave, I guess I, I just want to start uh, with a little about you and your background uh, and kind of how you uh, landed at your position today at Bandura. Yeah, so I'm the chief technology officer at Bandura, which was a spin out from a company called TechGuard Security. I started there in 2002 and kind of, kind of grew with the company. As the company got bigger, we all grew together. And then at one point, we decided we need to take our technology and spin that out uh, into a different company that was optimized for actually selling security products and the, the specific needs of the users that needed that technology. So I've been with the company, uh, its founding since 2002, been here for a while, and been with Bandura since its foundation. That's awesome. Dave, I wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about the technology um, as, you know, Bandura is able to collect a lot of threat intelligence data, um, millions of IP addresses, correct, and normalize that data and act upon it uh, and tell other things to act upon it as well. Tell us a little bit about the technology in, inside, you know, kind of under the covers. I mean, we don't need the, you know, patented technology <laughs> or schematics, right? But, you know, just to uh, speak to how you're able to accomplish uh, threat intelligence at scale. Well, well, the patented technologies, anybody can just do research on those and read about the patented stuff. Uh, the stuff that's not patented, I, I probably can't go into. But basically, uh, it, it involves how do you work with very, very large amounts of data. Uh, and it's not necessarily a big data problem where you're working with terabytes, but we're working with you know tens of millions of indicators, whether they're domain-based indicators or IP-based indicators. And we're having to process those in real time. And that's what makes it a tricky problem. Right, so if you get packets coming in on a 10 gig network, you're doing about 30 million packets per second. That doesn't give you a lot of time to analyze each packet and figure out what's the risk associated with that particular connection coming into and out of a network. So it's really about how do we manage large amounts of data and then how do we access that effectively and efficiently in real time so we don't add any latency into the network. And our technology does allow us to have up to 100 million indicators it's as far as we've tested uh, and, you know, latency down in the several microseconds. So, but it's really about how you structure the data, how you get the data on. And then the other piece of that is how do you get the data into the system? Uh, and that's where integration with other products that are out there, like threat intelligence platforms, whether they're open source or commercial and pulling feeds via sticks and taxi, uh, pulling the data that's available via HTTP, pulling all that together, you know, normalizing that, putting it into a common data format and getting it available to our devices. Yeah, it sounds like there's there's little room for error when you have software and hardware that's processing that much data and not introducing latency, correct? There's certainly no room for inefficiency. There's never room for error, whether you're doing it fast or whether you're doing it slow. Oh, that's a great point. Right? The yeah. <laughs> what it's supposed to do. But uh, what's really important is how you, you structure data. And this is definitely a techno technique technological spin on on the problem or discussion of it but you know how you organize data how you search data you know everything's got to be done just right and I've got engines that are searching through the data at the same time I've got systems that are updating the data changing the risks associated with countries with organizations with IP addresses and all those have to coexist together uh, with multiple threads working together on the system so it's it's a difficult computer science problem. My background mm. is computer science. Mm. So uh, I, I came up in the operating system world, working in operating systems, where you deal with things like the uh, process scheduling, disk I/O scheduling, where things have to happen very fast and they have to always happen and always happen correctly. Mm. That's really awesome. Um, now, one of the the things with with threat intelligence, and it's interesting you uh, you know interviewing uh, Todd and, and speaking with you, Dave. I'm I'm really coming around to seeing the value of threat intelligence, and I I kind of I liken it to other technologies that I think really help increase your overall return on your security investments. Because I mean, at the end of the day, you're taking out a lot of the noise, right? And I look Absolutely. at um, like bot uh, detection in, in your web applications, like they're just filtering out anything that could be a bot. So then when you're looking at your other technologies, you're, you're getting more value out of them because there's less noise to filter through. Is that, is that probably one of your, your stories that you're, you're telling in the marketplace today? Yeah, that, that is certainly one of the stories is to reduce that attack space to make that as small as you can. Uh, and, and doing things like uh, you start with the most basics of geofiltering. If you wanted to do that, you could do it in a firewall or router. But 
thousands of rules for every country that you would want to control the flow access of. And then you get into organizations doing things by a kind of system number, which would be able to address things like certain ISPs you don't want to connect into the network. Uh, and then you get into your blacklist, your threat intelligence, and how you work with all that. Uh, so, yeah, there's a, a lot going on there to reduce the attack space. And the benefit of that is when it gets to your firewall, if you're running a next generation firewall that's doing web application filtering, those cycles are really expensive. The cycles of going through and inspecting the traffic, reassembling the packet so you get a data flow you can analyze, you know, looking at are there attacks of a pattern in there, patterns of attack, things that I need to block. That's expensive. So why spend those CPU cycles on things that you could just throw away at the border? So by reducing that attack space, now you make your network more secure, but those other devices, your firewalls, your IDSs, uh, they don't have to look at as much stuff and that makes them operate more efficiently. And a lot of times you can turn on more rules where you had to turn things off before just to get acceptable levels of performance. Yeah, I, I really love that because um, uh, some of the briefings I've done with enterprises, you know, they come to me and say, well, we really want to make the most out of our next generation firewall, whatever the platform is. And, you know, the the next generation firewall vendors have all these wonderful features they're adding on. They're like, well, you can block people based on their role and tie into Active Directory and do SSL decryption and it can act as a WAF. And they're like, we want to turn on all these features because we you know, made an investment in this technology. And I'm like, you got 100,000 people going through a set of those devices? Like, you sure you want to do that? But with your technology, like you said, it allows you to explore some of those other options that before weren't possible with your other security investments. Yeah, and, and in larger systems, it's not just 100,000 users, but we see systems that we're, we're in front of that are doing 100,000 connections per second. So wow. that's every second, there's 100,000 connections coming through that have to be evaluated. And that's 100,000 connections that your web application firewalls your next generation firewalls have to mine through. And if you can cut some of that down, anything that you can cut out makes those boxes operate more effectively. You know, it's interesting you say that, Dave. Um, in my own personal experience, that really resonates. And a, a lot of times today, I, I think back on when in 2001, I started working for a university in security and I was the firewall expert and they were implementing their first firewall. Now, even back in 2001, the amount of traffic that we were passing through certain points of our network was tremendous for that time. And I would start standing up firewalls and putting them in place and they would just fall down. Like they would just crumble and cry with the traffic I was uh, putting on. So a lot of solutions I see today, I'm like, well, I wish I had that when I worked at the university, I could have been so much more effective. And not only that, the other groups in the organization would trust me more easily because back then I'd put a firewall in, there would be an event, the firewall would fall over and they'd blame the firewall guy, right? Or gal. <laughs> they always blame the networking people, no matter what mm -hmm. happens. The application dies, it's always the networking guy. The firewall dies, it's always the networking. Always right. blame it on the network. That's the easy one to blame. I tell you, the universities, that's certainly a, a, a tough role to fill uh, because they temp tend to not block anything and to allow everything. So now yeah. that you have thousands of students accessing the internet, doing the things they normally do, of those thousands, you've got hundreds of them that are running gaming servers and their mm -hmm. own little businesses they've set up with FTP servers, web servers. Uh, and those things, again, can get, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of connections per second. And that can kill most firewalls. They just fall over. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, so uh, Matt, the questions, uh, you know, along these lines? Yeah, what's interesting about the technology, because I've, I've, you know, I've seen the Bandura uh, stuff before is, you know, one of the big challenges with threat intelligence was making it actionable, um, which is something that Bandura can do, right, is based on risk levels, the ability to actually take some action. But I think it's interesting is how it works with the rest of the ecosystem, um, you know, where it sits um, and how does it really play well with the other security investments like the firewall, like the IDS, IPS, you know, those are really interesting to see how you maximize the investment of your other security products by kind of getting that noise out of the way. And I think that's really interesting uh, value proposition for some of the enterprise organizations that, that are struggling with, you know, how do I get more out of some of my other security investments is kind of where the solution fits in a little bit. 
Yeah, I like how you mentioned ecosystems in there because that's the way we like to think of it is that we're not just a standalone piece of, of equipment in the network, but part of a functioning, uh, living, breathing security system. So in addition to offloading work from the firewalls, we're doing things like interacting with the firewalls, next gen uh, systems, IDSs. So for instance, an IDS that picks up an alert of an intrusion attempt uh, or something going out either way. You know, we can extract the IP address out of those alerts and actually use those to inject into our system in real time. So rather than, you know, we got an alert, let's figure out what we're going to do with it. Uh, let's get a firewall rule change request done, get it signed, get it submitted. And maybe two or three hours later, you get a change in. We can have the change in within about a second of the time that it's actually detected in the IDS. And then so, on the other direction, we oh, take... Yeah, so Dave, that that's interesting. So you take data from the uh, systems that I have on my network, as well as from external yeah. sources. That's, that's an interesting point. I like that. So, you know, we're taking it from all t sorts of disparate uh, threat intelligence sources. And one of them that people often overlook is their own system. What's going on in your network? There's a lot of great information there. And starting with your IDSs and your firewall alerts, you see a lot of stuff that's going on there. Uh, you know, you, you detonate something in a product like FireEye and you see that it's trying to make a connection out to a specific IP. Uh, you can immediately block the outbound connections to that IP in case there's another piece of malware that's maybe trying to use the same IP. So you can do those things. And then additionally, we roll all the metadata up about what's going on in the network uh, out to systems like uh, Splunk or Logarithm or whatever SIM you happen to be using. So metadata about the number of connections and allowed per country, per organization, per threat intelligence category. So how many outbound requests to possible command and control servers or data exfil sites. So we log all that data. That can go into your data analysis systems, uh, whether it's SIMS or whether it's a, you know, a more of a enterprise information analysis type system where you can look at that and you can start to spot trends and see things that are happening uh, that you know traffic from a certain organization is considerably higher than it normally is so you might be able to identify an internet service provider that's been compromised and now all the connections from that service provider are at a higher risk than they were before so there's a lot of great information that's coming out of our product as opposed to what it's doing at the perimeter and things that we're doing going forward are adding new features in there to be able to analyze that in real time, give feedback, and then use that to actually adjust our risk levels for every connection that comes in and out of the network. Yeah, so, so that's say, that's like yeah. a different computer science problem, right? Like we have the we have to process all of that data quickly and not introduce latency. But then there's all of the decisions and various factors you have to take into consideration to calculate a score. And a lot of enterprises I've I've spoken with will try and write that software themselves, and they'll come to me and say we're we're struggling, Paul, because we're trying to write all these custom scripts to make sense of all this threat intelligence data, and, and we're, we're lost. We're spending too much time on it, and we're not able to make it work. And I think your solution is one of the answers to that, right, is don't it do is. all that work yourself, right? You've, you've done the, the computer science and the hard decision trees to qualify this data. It, it becomes a machine learning process at that point to be able to grind through that much data and be able to spot the trends and where the risk spots are and then feed that back into our engine. So if we make that available to our customers, then that's one less thing that they'll have to grind through themselves. Yeah. So we're all about making yeah. it as easy as it can possibly be. This is one of the challenges I think the Sims had early on with threat intelligence data, right? Mm -hmm. Is you had to kind of know the use case and then program the use case into the Sim to detect the event. If you can not have to worry about knowing the use case in advance and really use the data and some machine learning, you can actually make the Sims more efficient because they don't have to, they don't have to pre-know the use case. This has been one of these, right. you know, challenges on how best to use threat intelligence data at the Sim layer. Yeah, so we've been able to spot trends to see things like that certain attacks at certain times of day will, will rise up. So like uh, late at night for U.S. customers are seeing more activity from the other side of the world. But at the same time, they're also seeing less normal activity from this side. So what you see is certain countries, um, the, the risk goes up at night versus the, the cost of a false positive. So you can do things like through scripting and automation actually increase the risk of a connection, say it's coming from Russia, right? So during the day, you might use the normal but threat intelligence says it's got a score of 90 out of 100. But after 8 p.m., you might want to bump that up to 95. And then after midnight, you bump it up to 100. So you can actually adjust those scores based on the time of day and based on current network patterns. 
Yeah, those I, are the things that make it really easy for the security guy to not have to spend all his time typing on the keyboard. Yeah, I really like that because when if I look at that in the threat hunting context, right, we apply similar uh, criteria, right? We look at the length of the connection, the data size, the number of packets, where it's coming from, and then time, right, is also a factor. What time of day it was, right. in, in all, but you're building that into the product and making it easy for the uh, enterprise security teams to say, yes, this is the criteria, adjust the score uh, accordingly, which I, I, I really like a lot. Exactly. Um, I also, I you know, as we, we talk, Dave, I and I advise people on threat intelligence, it's been a hot topic for the past year or two, I think, um, it, it, probably beyond that, but I've fielded a lot of calls on it. And the, uh, the common question is, which threat intelligence feeds should I subscribe to? Right, and now they're balancing that with cost, in addition to the management overhead of like when I once I get two to six to ten feeds, how do I manage that? Right, so there's a lot of decisions that go um, into that. What what I recommend, I want to get your and Matt's opinion on this is get an industry specific feed. It's for like financial industry, right? Has the ISAC feed, I think it is, um, which I think is very useful for financial industries. And then I'm like, use the lower cost or free ones and get some tools to help you do that and don't do it yourself. Is that is that kind of along the lines of what, what Bandora is recommending today as well? Yeah, ab absolutely. So if you're in a specific industry, you know, your state government, you want to use state, local government, you want to use your MSI SEC, multi-state, your financial, you want to use your FSI SAC. So your industry specific feeds are always really, really important. And then there's other feeds that are available like for instance, we make available the, the DHS CISP feed, which is the sharing program between uh, federal and commercial entities. Uh, so that data is available uh, via sticks and taxi to our system. We make that available as well. So having some broader coverage using multiple feeds uh, and using one or two commercial with a couple of open source is always a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, there's threat intelligence platforms out there that that's specifically what they do is help you aggregate that. But if you don't want to incur the expense of buying one of those, especially if you're a smaller company, our product does allow you to do aggregation of threat intelligence feeds. So you can simply go in and go, I want to use the Zeus tracker feed from abuse.ch and we'll automatically pull that update it, deliver to our products. And that's not a recommendation to use that particular feed. I use that as an example, but uh, we have plugins for even commercial feeds as well. So if you're using WebRoot, Proofpoint, Semantic, uh, something like that. We can pull all that data and we can also pull from a threat intelligence platform. So if you're using, um, you know, alien bolt OTX, if you're using mm -hmm. something like that to aggregate multiple feeds together, we can pull from that. So there's a lot of good data out there, but there's also a lot of bad data out there. And that's a particular challenge is how do you know what's good and what's bad? Uh, I think people need to avoid the temptation to use everything that's out there. Mm. Oh, there's a list I should use it. Uh, because a lot of it, you know, could be published by maniacs. You don't know the people that published right. it. You don't know how valid it is. And it could be an attempt to, uh, to DDoS one of their competitors when they publish it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, it's that balance between cost and how effective is it, right? There's always mm -hmm. that little balancing act. And, you know, early on it was take every feed you can, but if the feed's not providing additional value above and beyond your base feeds, why are you spending the money on it? So what's that right balance? Yeah, there's a lot of the feed providers out there that are using and buying intelligence from the same sources. So, mm. you know, we've looked at some and we see there's a lot of overlap between them. So one of the things that we particularly do when we're choosing a vendor that we want to partner with and recommend to our users is we start looking at what's the overlap between those and the other feeds. Are they truly pulling unique indicators? Or are they just buying somebody else's data and reselling it? Uh, and that data that they buy and resell is fine, but if you've got three different vendors that are reselling you the same data, then you're really throwing your money away. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And it's interesting, I, when I did some research on this for some DNS blacklisting, um, I was pulling some feeds and doing some analysis, and I pulled some feeds that would block advertisements, right? Like banner advertisements and domains mm -hmm. known to be associated with advertising. And then I pulled an open source feed that was detecting malware and malicious behavior. And when I did the diff, there was a, a good amount of overlap, which made me really, really nervous. 
right? Yeah, <laughs> because for sure, I, and it's that just can be a bad uh, situation. Uh, Dave, we also talked about one of uh, my recommendations uh, when an organization wants to be a little more lean as to how they approach threat intelligence was to point them to some of the open source tools and projects, and one of them was the collective intelligence framework. And I believe you said before that you, if you have that, that's okay. And you can have Bandura and, and those will integrate together. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so that would be another one of those threat intelligence platform products that uh, are really proliferating in the market right now. Uh, that their job is to help you understand all the threat intelligence, pull it all together, find the overlaps between it, uh, try to put some ranking of, of how trustworthy uh, the data is, and then provide you some usable data. Uh, from that point, once you have usable data, uh, if you're using a firewall or something like that, it's a matter of, okay, which 10 to 50,000 of the most usable entries uh, do I want to use? With our product, we're able to pull all the entries, assuming there's less than 100 million, and I haven't seen a system yet that pulled over 10 or 20 million. Mm. Uh, so we got a lot of headroom there. But yeah, we certainly integrate with those, so we can take everything coming from CIF and pull that into our products and basically take action on that be able to block connections both inbound and outbound based on those IPs. And we also do domain-based stuff too. So we're not strictly IP. Mm -hmm. So from a domain point of view, we're functioning as a, a transparent DNS proxy, if you will. So examining every outbound DNS request. And if it's a request for one of those blacklisted domain names, uh, whether it's from phishing or from malware, uh, or if you want to blacklist it because it's serving up ads, uh, we can basically return back to the caller. That's an NX domain. Don't go there. You can't go there. Uh, stay away. Stay away. Oh, so that's I like that. I like that so much better than the way I'm doing it now. Because right now I'm I'm updating. You know, DNS. Um, my DNS server is taking in the blacklisted information, uh, and the DNS server basically has the information about what's good and what's bad. But in in your system, you don't have to touch. You don't have to go update my DNS records. You just do it on the fly because you're at layer two and you're just responding. Uh, to those exactly. requests. Exactly. So uh, you don't have to update your DNS. You don't have to depend that your users are using your DNS. Yeah. Uh, well, hopefully your firewall is only allowing outbound DNS requests from your DNS server, but a lot of people don't do that. And then laptops can go directly out to Google's DNS servers. Malware can use their own DNS server. So by, by being in that path, we're able to look at every DNS request that goes out. And not only can we uh, do blacklisted DNS, but we also do whitelisted DNS, mm -hmm. which it seems kind of counterintuitive. Like if I know this is a bad domain, why would I want to whitelist it? We don't use it that way. We use whitelisted domains to be able to say, okay, you're blocking a particular country or an organization or some particular block of IP addresses. But if there's a specific domain that's in that IP range that needs to have access, when we see somebody make an outbound DNS query for you know, Ubuntu.com, for mm -hmm. instance, right? We get the IP addresses for that query and we inject them into an exception list to allow those connections to go out, even though there may be a policy that says the curve, the, the country where the server exists isn't allowed for outbound access. So it lets us do dynamic whitelisting of IPs based on trusted domain names. Yeah, the whitelisting is super important. And in, in our use case, uh, you know, we're uh, partly a marketing firm as well. And so we do a lot of things with advertising services. Sometimes it's, you know, a sponsor might be using a specific ad service and we can't like test or help them because our blacklisting is blocking it. So we, we have to have yeah. the ability to add exceptions uh, for business use cases. Yeah, like my act on URLs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Matt is kind of test that, right? It, we test the sponsor site. We're like, it's not working. And then I'm like, oh, did you bypass the DNS blocking? Which also speaks to your point, Dave, because internally... Mm -hmm. We just point to Google's DNS to test stuff. But then if the user forgets to switch it back, then they're susceptible to malicious domains. Yeah. So this makes it where the user doesn't have to think about how do I reconfigure my DNS or how do I reconfigure my clients? Uh, everything is just done transparently. And anything that we can make happen easier and transparently for the security engineer, it frees up cycles for them. You know, we talked earlier about the cycles on your hardware, the CPU cycles mm. that you deep packet inspection, what's far more valuable than that is the the brain cycles of that security engineer that's having to monitor the network. So if they're spending all their time doing mundane tasks like that, uh, that's time they could be doing other, you know, more valuable tasks, actually doing analysis work, trying to figure out where the, the vectors of attack are, where the weaknesses are, where they need to be strengthening things, where they need to be digging deeper. 
Yeah, I, I like that too because one of my strategies here and in, in for enterprises as well is you know that users are going to click on stuff by accident, right? But Always. by putting that in a, a central point, you're eliminating a lot of those threats um, without really having to put much effort into it, right? I'm not deploying right. you know an enterprise endpoint protection system thing that's going to protect me from everything. Something might slip through, but this is another line of defense uh, that doesn't impact the user. I don't have to put an agent on their system to get a certain right. level of protection in this case. Something that we've always have strived to do at Bandura, uh, our motto is enterprise security for everyone. So instead of saying, okay, the big companies, they can have the really great security, but if you're a little guy, you just have to use whatever you can get at your local electronic superstore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that doesn't help secure the national infrastructure. It doesn't help us be stronger as a collective internet. So by making our, our technology available for everyone, so our little products, our little desktop products do the same number of indicators as our big enterprise products, albeit not as the same number of connections per second. So the throughput's sure. not as high, but as far as the features, the domain whitelisting, the domain blacklisting, uh, all of the threat intelligence indicators, they do the same thing the big guys do. So. And a lot of those smaller companies don't even have a dedicated security engineer. Sure. There's maybe one guy that's doing the networking and mm -hmm. the firewall. Mm -hmm. So making their job easy is really important. Dave, I was wondering if you could speak to the integrations uh, and the API. It, it sounds like you have integrations already built in that you can you know click through the interface and connect to certain firewall platforms. But also, if I want to tie things together... Um, you know, talk about how I interact with that with that API and, and integrate into other things. Sure. So we have have plugins built into our system that can interact with different threat intelligence sources. Uh, and the popular ones we've already got developed. But if a customer comes to us and they say, "Can you use this feed?" and we've never used it before, we can simply just develop a new plugin for that. And that's usually, you know, a one or two today thing. So from that aspect, you know, that it's more of an architectural thing. But on the flip side of that is customers want to be able to automate our software. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we access that programmatically? I don't want to have to log in and click through things, make a change. I want it to interact with the other systems. Uh, and that's where we have a full REST API around our product. Uh, I think you're seeing more and more applications that are doing that as we're moving to cloud-based applications. But there's really no reason that appliances can't do the same thing as well. So uh, you can log on to our box via REST API. Uh, and then you can do things like add things to exception lists, block countries, uh, change the threat indicators you want to block, change you know the the level of risk that you're willing to accept. Anything that you can do in our UI, you can do through the REST API as well. So that enables you to do some really interesting things. Uh, like for instance, if you wanted to integrate with Active Directory or a Radius server, for instance, when a user logs into the system, you can find out what IP address they've been assigned, and then you can dynamically create a network resource group for that particular IP or IP range, and then set policies according to what that user needs. So even though that's something not built into our system, if somebody wants to do that, they can easily use our API to enable those sorts of, of logic. And then if we have enough people asking about it, maybe it becomes a, fe a feature in the future, mm. a future feature. And then I'm sure the integration into a lot of the newer security uh, orchestration and automation platforms, which, you know, they're standalone uh, versions of that. And then uh, many vendors are building that into their own products. I'm assuming it's a logical fit as, to integrate with Bandura uh, to work into that orchestration and automation workflow. Yeah, any of those orchestration devices out there and some of the threat intelligence platforms are doing orchestration based on security events as well. Uh, you can do it in, in Splunk or other uh, other SIMs out there where you can detect things and orchestrate that. And having that full REST API around our stuff allows us to integrate very easily into those systems. In fact, we have one API that's designed specifically for interacting. It's called React. Uh, that's designed to take a IP and IP metadata about existing alerts. And it can be basically sandboxed for a given period of time. So, you know, an IDS sees somebody doing port scans. You might want to block them for the next 10 minutes just so they go away. Uh, you see somebody trying to do a more malicious attack, you might want to block them for 48 hours. But it's all time sandboxing and it takes care of automatically uh, removing those rules. You know, from an automation and orchestration point of view, is something that gets overlooked a lot. Is It's not just about adding the things you need to block in there, but it's also about removing those when they become stale because they do become stale you know, rather quickly. Bad guys don't tend to stay on the same IP address 
for more than 24 hours and usually it's a lot shorter than that. Yeah, I, I ran into that a lot at the university. You know, we would try and block people and then we'd leave the block in place on a router somewhere and didn't have really good management or visibility into all of our rules. And then the help desk would feel the call it gets escalated to, to networking and they're like, I can't get on uh, on the network. And you're like, oh, you reused an IP that was blocked because someone had, you know, downloaded pirated music or something, right? Right. <laughs> and from internet service providers that are given out IP addresses via DHCP and IP address mm -hmm. gets handed out. Somebody does some, you know, wicked bad stuff with it. They get on a blacklist, they move on. And then the next day a valid customer gets that IP address, right? So it's really important to be able to time those out. And that's something that most security engineers don't have time for when it's, I can either remove the old crusty stale stuff or I can put a rule in for the latest you know, thing that's going to break my network and cause me to lose my job, which are you going to do? You're going to do the one that's, you know, the, the most timely and you're going to leave those stale entries out there. So mm -hmm. having an automated system, you know, and you, I'm saying automated a lot because I think it's really important that, you know, that we do automate a lot of the things that we're doing in cybersecurity. Yeah, so I agree. Are, we need to do it too. That's why we're going to see more adoption of these kind of security orchestration automation tools. We just, as humans, we just can't keep up anymore. Absolutely. Problem's too big. Yep. Um, so, David, if you could just talk about uh, some of the future roadmap items and some of the things that you might be considering uh, implementing in, inside of the product. Uh, can't, probably can't go into too many of those things, but uh, the one thing that I mentioned earlier that, uh, that we are going to be doing is the um, adding the machine learning processes into the system where we can start automatically uh, detecting things that are higher risk so that we can see. Uh, you know, what rules and policies might need to be changed uh, and then possibly allowing the users to enable automatic risk adjustment based on the machine learning pieces. Uh, the other thing that we're adding to our products, we're adding a lot more reporting. Uh, visibility is a big piece of this. Um, people don't have the visibility into their network that they would like to have. I know that from all the people at least that I've worked with. Uh, so we're providing a lot more visibility. We've got a lot of data, but to make that useful, you know, we need more reports, more graphs. We have a lot of customers that have compliance issues. They need very specific reports. So a big piece of what's going on in our product in the future is revolving around uh, now that we've got this technology in place to block the high-risk connections. And I can tell you all about them, what got blocked, what made it through. Now, how do we report on that? How do we put it into a format that the, the CISOs and the CIOs can look at and see that they're getting good value for the money spent? So the, the engineers already get it. So, but we, you know, the value props got to move up the chain. Mm. That's awesome. Uh, anything else you want to share with our listeners uh, today or Matt, any, any other questions for Dave? I just want to know when the big um, global map of threats is, is, is that in there yet? Is it coming? <laughs> the, the, the big global automated map where it looks like missile shots from Russia and they're landing in Chicago and that map. Yeah, that one. The old Norse map. I wasn't going to mention the name, but I had a feeling that you were talking about. The <laughs> Norse map was awesome. It was a pretty thing to look at. Uh, I can't say that it actually conveyed any useful information, but it was a great sales tool. So at some point, maybe we could do something like that, but I would prefer to do it with real data as opposed to mocked up data. Uh, and that's a hard thing to do without sharing information about all your customers. And privacy is really important. So if I'm tracking a, you know, an attack on somebody's network from Russia and I publish that, even if it's at a high level, it makes me feel a little uneasy. So probably won't be coming anytime in the near future, but um, who knows, maybe someday. We're all waiting for it. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, if you're interested uh, in more uh, from Bandora, you can visit bandora.com forward slash security weekly uh, is the URL, which will take you there. Uh, and learn more about their products. Dave, thank you very much for appearing on Enterprise Security Weekly. It's actually bandurasystems.com. I knew that. It's bandurasystems.com forward slash security weekly. Excellent. Dave, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.